we just screened the film Pervert Park, who um, Don is in the film as a counselor. Could you tell me, um, first off, what is the film about? It's about a day in the life of uh, sex offenders in Pinellas County, Florida. There are about 120 of them that live at this park. We have a, a trailer park just for them because the state law doesn't allow them to live anywhere near parks, playgrounds, schools, restaurants, bus stops, daycare centers, churches. So there's nowhere to live. So we created this place that's a kind of a safe environment for them. And uh, the rents are really reasonable. We made a deal with the owner, so they're not gouged. And then I show up uh, several times a week and do the therapy because they don't have any cars or transportation. So it's a little community of sex offenders. They're all court ordered, and I'm kind of their ringleader in the counseling world. How did you um, get started in uh, this line of work? Um, that's interesting. I was involved in treating the victims for many years, and I had a grant from uh, youth services to make sure that young children did not recant the allegations to try to protect the offender. If they did, they were put in foster care, and that was a horror for the victims. And, of course, the offenders were then re released from jail, and the theory was they'd just go down the line and molest all the other kids in the family. So I, I accepted the assignment, and I uh, learned almost immediately from the victims that they wanted their families to get help. Well, there wasn't any help. There weren't any offender programs. But I wanted to keep the victims complying with the treatment and not recanting as my grant uh, mandated. So I started seeing the offenders. I'd go into the jails and interview them. And after about six months, I had, you know, 25 of them. So I started a group and it uh, wasn't the job I applied for. I didn't know anything, that's for sure. <laughs> I got my, um, my master's degree in the 70s. We hadn't even written any real books about how to treat offenders. There was one book about uh, rape, uh, Nicholas Groth, Men Who Rape, but even that wasn't a treatment book. It was just highlighting the problem in America. So I was flying by the seat of my pants, and uh, I think pretty much the offenders taught me everything I know. They decided that uh, they needed a spokesperson and somebody to uh, try to help them, and I was willing to uh, treat their kids and their wives and advocate for them getting back with their families someday. So it all just kind of fell into place. It's not the job I applied for. It's the one that found you. It's the job that found me. But I've enjoyed it and I've been doing it 32 years now. And although I'm newly retired and I'm turning it over to a colleague, uh, it's probably in my lifetime the, the most enjoyable work I've ever done. And um, as we were talking just now, um, prior to the interview, um, when you talk about sex offenders in the media, society, sex offender equals monster. They're no longer human beings. They're not people. How do you change society's um, thinking on these people are human and they're going to live a very long time. And if we keep putting them into that monster box, it's only going to keep perpetuating these cycles. Agreed. Um, I've always advocated for my offenders to come out from the shadows, to get proactive, to uh, speak about their issues. I've provided the venues for them by doing uh, films, documentaries. Um, I've always cooperated with the local TV networks. I um, even had a, a television show on Community Access Channel for eight years in our local community where the offenders starred in the shows. Uh, ran all the cameras and the equipment. We had to take a course to do that. And um, I found it was very therapeutic for them. Um, I took that cue from the 12-step world. I know Alcoholics Anonymous is anonymous for a reason, but my, my clients don't have that luxury of being anonymous. So you may as well just get out there and put it out there and show the world what we're made of. And you'll find that people will want to listen because the media sensationalism is not telling the real story. Uh, and that's how this film was made. The people in Sweden that came, uh, Frida and Lasse, Barkforce, they uh, heard that we were that open with the media, and so they came and spent a couple weeks with us. Uh, my clients were prepped to talk to the media. I've been pushing and advocating for that for uh, all my career. And um, 
you had the film Pervert Park, N not scripted, no rehearsals. Uh, nobody was told what to do or say. Uh, I didn't uh, ask the producers to pick the people to talk to that I think are my best client. Just go and talk to them and film whatever you want. And well, you saw the result in the film. And the film's almost a testament of all this work that you've been doing and yeah, I, I would say, but I, I give the credit to the offenders. They're the ones taking the real risks, you know, and um, I'm proud of them. One of the, um, as I'm watching this film tonight, one of the poignant lines that you said that, and I'm like, whoa, um, you said um, there is no healing in this kind of business. How do you, that's what you're trying to do is achieve some sort of healing. How do you, um, you've touched upon it already. How do you, is it, is, is it healing possible? I was being a little cynical, and I was referring to the system is not promoting healing. Uh, probation officers will tell you, my job isn't to help you, it's to protect the community. Um, as I said in my presentation, there's no, no help in the prisons anymore. Um, they're just not invested in doing anything to help these people succeed. And the ir irony is, sex offenders have the lowest recidivism rate, even without therapy. They re-offend less than any other criminal class. You give them support and show them some love and try to keep them safe and off the street and living in the woods, they'll do anything for you. Um, I've had a remarkable relapse rate. It's been less than 1% in my entire career, and that's pretty good, and I'm not trying to brag. Once again, I give the credit to the offenders. They're, they are untreated victims, they're acting out scripts, they're full of addiction issues, they're keeping a lot of secrets about their own families of abuse, and you give them an opportunity to move past that and they'll take it. And although it takes a couple years to get to that point, most of them succeed and uh, I don't think they're, they're gonna reoffend again. They, if you learn how to love, you learn how to find a healthy relationship, they confuse sex and love, they don't know the difference. And um, I invite their partners in, I invite their girlfriends to group, their family members can come, even their victims can come if they're, you know, not violating a court order for uh, contact and they're over 18 at this point. And most of their victims are because they've been in prison for 10 or 15 or even 20 years. So I'm all about healing their families. Uh, I'll go the extra mile for them. And uh, they really, really appreciate that and they respond. And I would hope that therapists uh, coming up in the counseling world would uh, give these people a chance. Uh, it's hard to find anybody willing to work with them. I'm one of the few in my county that's that's doing it. We need more therapists willing to take on this population. They'll be uh, very rewarded if they invest a little personal time. Um, could you um, can you talk about what that Jimmy Rice program is? Because it seemed pretty intense. <sighs> Here's my negativity against the law enforcement machine coming out again. Florida is all about punishing and incarcerating. And uh, they've come up with this scheme where they deny them treatment in prison. So they'll spend 10 or 15 or 20 years in prison with no counseling. When they take that step out of prison, the day they're released, their families are waiting for them, the balloons are going up, they arrest them again and say, we're holding you for civil commitment. And then they have to go to another trial, and the state tries to prove that because they haven't had treatment, they'll probably reoffend. Well, they haven't had treatment because the state's denied them treatment. Then they go to this treatment center, which is just an old rundown uh, facility, although they've built a new one because they got sued for the place they put them in in the beginning. Um, but it's a it's a prison they call it a treatment center but it's got barbed wires and guards with guns and there's no sentence you can be there for the rest of your life so it's like the movie minority report i don't know if you remember that one with tom cruise the premise of the movie was society can arrest you for a crime you haven't committed yet well they're doing that with the sex offenders in florida very scary the end of democracy if you ask me if they can if law enforcement can lock you up for something you haven't even done yet, I think we're in big trouble as a society. You're saying also in Florida, entrapment is something that's occurring all the time. The sex offender business, I call it a business. Uh, there's money in it for law enforcement. Uh, the more arrests they have, the, uh, the more police cars they get, 
we build more prisons in Florida than we build schools. So I think they're um, worried that the offenders aren't reoffending. They need more offenders to keep the, I know they'll scoff at this, but they're setting up um, stings all across the state where they entrap young, mostly young kids, college kids. They go on adult websites. The kids are uh, looking for sex partners. Um, they get them all jacked up. They might even send some pictures back and forth. And after you agree to meet, they'll say something like, oh, can my uh, teenage daughter come along? I don't have anybody to watch her. Or, or they'll go further and say, how would you like to uh, have sex with me in front of my daughter? Or can you teach my daughter something about sex? You say yes to any of that, you're a sex offender for life. They'll charge you with uh, using a computer for uh, uh, you know, molestation purposes, and uh, pretty much you you will register for the rest of your life as a sex offender. You will go to prison. Once you're a sex offender in Florida, um, you you're not going to find a good job, and you're not going to be able to live until you get off probation. You're going to have the thousand foot rule. So it's pretty rough for these 18 and 19 year old kids that don't know anything about sex yet, but we're on the wrong website. Uh, you know, getting dealt a blow like that. But law enforcement wants those numbers and they want those convictions and they get them. Entrapment's legal in Florida. I don't think most states are, are pulling this nonsense, but Florida's famous for it. I was wondering while watching the film, I mean, this is the work you've been doing, you're very passionate about, you've been doing it for many years. It's very intense work. You're listening to all these really intense stories. You go home with that. How do you handle that do you garden or how do you s separate the work from you know just letting that go and sitting there you know I'm always asked that question and I never know how to answer it uh, I I I really get I don't think I'm a, a drama queen kind of thing but I really feel empowered when people can make breakthroughs and share feelings and emotions uh, uh, it just makes me feel uh, good that they're they're getting something off their chest and I can be witness and and party to something so personal and intimate I feel honored so I don't I don't really go home and have nightmares about it I rarely do uh, my biggest problems are with the system not with the clients I have to deal with them being violated all the time because their electronic monitoring goes off they have to carry this equipment around and as you get older you forget it and you you go out the door and you don't bring the the one piece of the transmitter, boom, you're back in prison for 10 years. I lose a client a week in my program for uh, a violation on the electronic monitoring. Not because anybody's doing you know, anything wrong. It. And now the authorities will show, see, we've got 4,000 violations. Well, none of them are willful. or That's the stuff that gives me nightmares. And those are the things that keep me awake at night. And that's why I have gray hair. It's not because of the clients. Mm -hmm. Well, and they're dealing um, here that you've created a safe environment for them. However, people, it's wide open park. People can come and go. We see in the film that uh, one of the people living there went to uh, his laundry and had a bag of rats. That's uh, nightmarish and intense. Yeah, especially in the beginning. Um, at this stage of the game, uh, the community has calmed down because we're not creating any problems. And... As I said in the, uh, the little workshop after the film, the police used to be afraid to go to that park. It was a motorcycle gang kind of park. Uh, drug dealing, meth labs, killings, shootings. The crime rate has gone down to nothing since the offenders live there now, and we've remodeled the place. The trailers still look ugly and old. They're from the 50s, but they all have new walls and flooring, and you know we've redone all the plumbing. Bill in the film was our maintenance man. He works like a dog, so the place is actually pretty nice, you know, compared to living in the woods and starving to death. You know, uh, we make sure that they have food. We have churches come in, and uh, uh, restaurants will donate the food that they don't use that they're going to throw out. We have uh, church services come. To, to the palace. We even have an offender uh, pastor. He's an offender himself. Mm -hmm. He comes and ministers. Uh, we have 12-step groups in there. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a place where they can get a lot, a lot of help and a lot of support. And uh, I think that the, the neighbors have seen that they're trying to do the right thing. 
Once in a while, I have a problem with the media trying to sneak in, especially on Halloween. That's our scariest. They'll try to send some kids in there to knock on the doors, yeah. and they'll have cameras behind the, the bushes trying to, oh, a sex offender is handing out, can't, you know. But yeah, we, well, yeah, they're trying to sense, but we always catch them in the act and drive them off. Um, I said in the film, uh, my biggest problem was the prostitutes coming into the park at night. Uh, they, they're crack dealers. Uh, half of my clients are drug addicted, alcoholic, and you know, you're, you haven't had enough uh, time in, in uh, society yet. It's easy to fall prey to, to that. I, I do have a drug problem, and uh, I can't keep the prostitutes out. They come in at, you know, three and four in the morning. I don't have resources and guards, and the sheriff doesn't care. They're, they're not going to stop it, you know. So, but I don't really consider the prostitutes part of the neighborhood. So to answer your question, the neighborhood doesn't give me any real problems. They only did in the beginning, but I'd say after the first year, we didn't have any problems with the neighborhood. Um, I feel like your work and all the clients you've worked with, it's a real testament to counseling, rehabilitation, and education. And uh, I feel like this country needs to start, this country's building more prisons and punishing people than building schools and putting money into social services. So I, uh, it was an honor to meet you today, and, you. and I feel like what you're doing in the work that you know the people do for very little money and a big reward when rehabilitation that works you speaks to what this country could become you know, and should be you know we'll get there uh, I, I always remind myself that it took Alcoholics Anonymous 50 years to get our country behind treating alcoholics 50 years we used to torture them and abuse them put them in psychiatric hospitals inject them with insulin and they go into like this shock and you know electrodes and all kinds of horrible things and we look down at them as uh, shiftless and moralless it, it took that long for us and now you know there is federal legislation making sure that they get the help they need well i've only been working with the offenders 32 years so probably another 10 or 20 years before our society comes to see this problem for what it really is and I probably won't be around to see that, but 